Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. So, so glad, glad you join us, join us again. again. We, we have, have everyone along currently that we present on TV today. And, and so, so I will turn it over to her. Hey everyone, I'm Emily Wong and um, I'm really excited to have another chance to present this to you. Um, hopefully everybody was able to attend that was able to last week. Um, you may have noticed that my hair is a little bit brighter, so hopefully we're going to have a lot better luck. Uh, so let's get started. Um, so sensory and chemistry, defining a brand with palatable knowledge. Uh, so. We're going to go over quite a few things today. Um, we're going to go over how to do a really good sensory program, off flavors, and how you can establish true to brand and why basically you should. So moving on from there, a little bit about me. So I am the founder and overlord of Firmly uh, Labs here in Denver, Colorado. I'm an alcohol trade and tax bureau certified brewing chemist which means that uh, I need to, that I have to basically not just have the education, I also have to have the equipment and I have to be able to meld the two together and actually pass a test in order to get that kind of certification. I'm also a professional brewer. I do technical brewing writing. Um, I also do a lot of presentations on different things from oxidation to sensory, uh, to basically starting your own lab. I'm also a member of the Pink Boots Society, Master Brewers Association of the Americas, and importantly, the American Society of Brewing Chemists. Now let's start off with what is true to brand. Uh, every brand needs to be evaluated and understood. Even professionals struggle with how a brand can change based off of ingredient system or personnel, especially from batch to batch. So to maintain consistency, an analysis needs to be done and needs to be defined. And these are the things that you really need to focus on. I don't care if you're a professional or a home brewer. There's a lot of people that still struggle with kind of making sure that they establish what that brand flavor is. What are the, what should it be? Is it malt? Is it hops? Is it adjuncts? Or in the case of my breakfast beer, tea, uh, which also I need a little bit of. So carbonation, is it appropriate for the style? Does it have an aroma? Um, for example, the one that I'm drinking right now has a very strong scent of lavender and bergamot. Uh, but for some, it may be bitter or sweet. I have a friend that whenever she smells a specific hop, it's always bubble gum. Is it soapy? Color, is it darker than intended? Is it lighter than intended? Is it right where you want it to be? And the mouthfeel, is it cloying? Is it light? Is it chewy? And off flavors, if there are any, are they acceptable in this style? And we're going, and that all matters so that you can detail it and be able to pass that on to people that are going to be able to help you in analyzing, are you hitting what you want from batch to batch? And it's more of a challenge, especially when you are individually brewing a separate beer and you don't have the option that macro breweries do of being able to blend and find that perfect balance. So flavor sources, uh, there's can, there can be quite a few. Uh, malt, pale malts tend to be more doughy, white bread or water crackers, but if you get more roasted, um, roasted malts, then you're going to end up toasty. Uh, and that's due to the kilning process. A then we can move on to hops. A variety of flavors can be attained um, from pineapple, mango, to green onion, to garlic, to coconut, or as I previously mentioned, bubblegum, which is still a weird one to me. I don't know why you want that in a beer, but okay, we can work with that. So then we move on to yeast. And a lot of us choose our yeast based off of kind of the flavor profile, but also the style of beer. They produce esters and phenols that can give a variety of notes from fruity to barnyard, uh, if you're going from Saccharomyces to Brettanomyces. With bacteria, uh, it's great. They produce some really fun acids that are not hallucinogenic. I know, very disappointing for a lot of people, but also sometimes you really don't want those. And when you do end up encountering that in a beer, doing these um, analytical panels are going to help you be able to understand when that is showing up and hopefully be able to be proactive about how you can address it. And lastly, but also firstly, 
Water, do you understand the chemical composition of your water? And how is that impacting your mashing, your fermentation, and the hopping? So the one thing that people tend to miss is that uh, they don't tend, you know, when they ask somebody to help them with their analysis, and I know that not all of us have employees, but we do have friends. And friends need to know kind of where to go with describing what the beer tastes like. Uh, we have a friend that described a beer as licking a forest floor, and although that is wonderful prose, it is not going to help really with, okay, so what flavors are you actually tasting, and how can I move forward with this? Is this good or bad? What do I need to change, or do I need to change anything at all? So that's, so you really want to make sure that you use something like the flavor wheel or the beer flavor map, and that will help you kind of better establish the um, language that you want people to use and address. So moving on to color, uh, color is quantified using the standard reference method, otherwise known as SRM, and can be analyzed fairly easily with a card similar to the one on the right. However, it is the lexicon that will matter here, just as it did with flavor when discussing the beer. What is the color? Straw, yellow, orange, amber, brown, black, etc. And uh, may be emphasized by saying light or dark. For more novel colors, using standard terms for colors like red, pink, or purple, especially when you get into some of the more heavily fruited varieties and some of the spontaneous lambics, which are some of my personal favorites, um, as one may find in a lot of those. It is also important to keep in mind the clarity and define this as well. A lager may be perfectly clear, but a wheat beer is going to display significantly more turbidity. Tannins are frequently used actually to maintain a haze in particular styles. Uh, locally, we have Avery Brewing's White Rascal, a Belgian style white ale. In order for them to maintain that haze, they actually systematically inject tannins in during, during the process. So then we also have to consider particulates, uh, especially when we're talking about those lovely, lovely hazy IPAs. Um, should also be considered, um, especially if you're observing any visible solids, any actual hot matter. Um, in addition, you also want to consider the head color, size, and also that retention in context of, of course, that specific style. So with aroma, um, to start off, start with a swirl. Just swirl the glass, help draw those aroma molecules out of the beer. Um, attempt to be a little bit consistent in the method to help focus the mind on the task at hand. It really can help make it more of a meditative state. So you can do just a nice woof, woof, woof. Just try and be rhythmic with it. You don't have to be aggressive. Just take the time it takes to just kind of get those and get them active, get them up so that you can begin to smell them. Now with a distant sniff, you can hold the glass at least a hand's length away from the nose and swirl. If there are any kind of really volatile or aromatic compounds, they're going to show up, but it wouldn't be surprising if you don't smell anything at that particular stage. The other one you can do is do a drive-by sniff. So that would be a swirl and then bring the glass just under the nose using short sniffs as it passes under. Another one is the short sniff. So you swirl the glass and bring it to your nose and take the short sniffs with the glass directly under the nose before drawing it away. And then you can do the long sniff. And of course, we're just going to swirl. Just make a pattern of it. Just really enjoy it. <laughs> it's a great workout for your wrist. Um, swirl yet again and bring it under the nose and take in a second long sniff. And then one of the favorites that I love watching whenever I attend any kind of sensory event is the covered sniff. Covering the lid of the glass with a hand swirl and uncover, bring under the nose for another second long sniff. And this helps concentrate the compounds that are a little bit less volatile, like some of those acids and esters that we were talking about to make them easier to sniff. And you definitely want to consider glassware um, for in, because it does help bring out certain aromatics. 
So in this particular picture I'm showing you here, it's a footed Pilsner glass and I have a lager in it. And that actually helps me get more of that bitterness of the hop compounds as opposed to just a regular pint glass. So definitely consider that kind of glassware and that should already be considered, especially when you're serving the beer. Carbonation is a pretty natural byproduct of fermentation, but we tend to kind of amp it up um, to experience different aspects of a beer's flavor. Um, it's defined in terms of volumes, and I just wanted to summarize basically um, some of the basic goals for some of these conventional styles. You should be monitoring your carbonation. Don't just carbonate it and assume, and assume that it's going to be perfectly carved. You do want to keep an eye on it, and you do want to make sure that all of your uh, dials and all of that are absolutely accurate. Otherwise, things might be a little bit too fun and a bit explosive. All right, so moving on from here, we have mouthfeel. Um, so obviously I am a consummate professional um, in everything, and uh, this is not how you uh, test for mouthfeel, but you know, I get, asked, I get asked quite a few times, how do you drink beer? And it's, this is how I kind of tease people. Um, but focusing again back on mouthfeel, um, so it encompasses several attributes and how they all interact. It is literally a sensational experience that goes beyond flavor. So when you get it in your mouth, the body light and watery to full and chewy, carbonation as we just discussed, warmth, ethanol and fusel alcohols which are experienced on the tongue and the back of the throat can be pleasant or inappropriate for the style. So you need to keep in mind, especially if you have a below 7% um, ABV beer, there shouldn't be any perceived warmth. Astringency, um, that can often come with bitterness. So this should be made distinct. You no know, drying sensations, which may take five to 10 seconds after the beer is no longer in the mouth. It may increase in intensity rather than be adapted to. Um, metallic, this can be caught in the aroma, but also tasted. And so this is kind of a weird one for people because if you can't necessarily taste it, there's a couple of ways of checking this, but it involves getting your hands or more specifically a finger uh, wet. So you can dip your finger in the beer and then swipe it across the back of your hand. And you may smell the metal after about five seconds. And this is due to the interaction of the metal ions with the fatty acids that are in your skin. The other is to swirl your finger in the beer to foam it up, then taste the foam off of your finger. And it's hoping that you'll have kind of a similar experience there. Uh, metal ions tend to migrate to the foam, so it is a good way to check for this. Something else to consider, especially if you like adding adjuncts and like having a little bit of fun, uh, capsation. So this should only be assessed in beers using chili peppers or similar additives. If you're out here in Colorado or New Mexico, people love adding chilies to their beers, uh, which it can be a wonderful experience or uh, mildly disturbing. Uh, so using these similar kind of techniques as with alcohol warmth, uh, this is a great way to check for those levels. And I'm going to take a brief sip. All right, so we're going to cover briefly um, a variety of the different off flavors. Uh, and we're going to go into how you can taste them. So I know that a lot of people tend to go over these, but it's always a kind of a good refresher, especially if anybody's new to this or uh, if they just kind of have some extra questions, especially since sometimes the opportunity doesn't, use, doesn't necessarily come up when actually tasting beers. Or if you've actually had an experience and uh, didn't want to embarrass your friend by asking them, what was that? <laughs> so we'll start off with diacetyl. So its threshold is about 10 to 40 parts per billion, and the flavors tend to be butter, butterscotch, oil slick, buttered popcorn. And this is one of the best off flavors for anyone to start off learning and recognizing. So if you are teaching uh, new people to help identify your Truda brand, you really want to start off with teaching them about this off flavor. And honestly, it can be very empowering, especially if you have people that are new to doing these kinds of sensory analyses. So um, this is expected in some styles like English ales or a Czech pale lager like the Pilsner Urkel. 
Um, it's a byproduct of fermentation during amino acid synthesis, and diacetyl's precursors to undergo oxidation to produce it. But further oxidation allows yeast to clean it up or break it down on its own, given time and temperature. That's why we have the diacetyl rest. So it's always fun when people talk about oxygen getting added to beers and that it's just the worst thing in the world. But honestly, in some cases, you do need it. And this is one of those circumstances. Uh, so some acid producing bacteria like Pediococcus and Lactobacillus uh, can also produce diacetyl. And enzymes are also on the market to accelerate cleaning it up, but it may be considered cheating by some brewers. I, it depends on which camp you want to go in and basically what you have possible, especially if you're doing a lager, because diacetyl can be extremely problematic in that if you are going to be going into, say, a metal and you are concerned. This is, enzymes are actually a really great way to resolve some of those issues. Um, so brewers could check for diacetyl by heating up a beer sample in a hot water bath for about 10 to 20 minutes. You can easily do this at home. Uh, you can basically get a pan, get a pot, heat that up, and make sure that you keep an eye on whatever you put in there. Try and make sure that it's kind of, you know, not going to be a problem or explode. And then you want to let it cool and then do a taste comparison with a non-heated sample. So um, one can pick up the diacetyl aroma pretty easily, and that indicates that the um, that indicates that the beer is still maturing. So this is so it's pretty simple. It's effective um, to test for it, but you really do have to do it pretty regularly to keep an eye on diacetyl levels, especially in particular styles. Next up, we have acetaldehyde, which is probably the second most common off flavor and also pretty easy to pick out with a threshold of five parts per billion. Uh, it tends to taste like latex paint, grass, green apple, pumpkin, which some people really are enjoying this time of year. OK, OK. So it is um, so it naturally occurs during fermentation and it's reduced to ethanol by the yeast but high volumes of oxygen, oxygen can reverse this process via oxygenation. So acetaldehyde is also formed when the yeast health is poor and can get worse when the yeast start to die and then burst open. So have patience with letting the yeast do their job, but also doing a proper diacetyl rest can help resolve these issues, but also taking initiative in avoiding oxidation later on during the brewing process, because ethanol will oxidize to acetaldehyde and then it will continue to acetic acid, which plays well since that's our one of the next ones. So lactic acid, we're not very familiar with their uh, threshold, but you get tend to, well, lactic, lactose, think of all of those dairy products you love, yogurt, tart, dairy, with acetic acid, it's, the threshold is 90 parts per million and the flavor is just vinegar because it's literally vinegar. Um, so these can be very common in sour beers, uh, like lactic acid, particularly in spontaneous beers because of the bacteria like Lactobacillus brevis, which ferments very cleanly. It can also be used to produce kettle sours. Occasionally, Pediococcus is also used to create a mixed culture fermentation. But since this bacteria is also known to produce a significant amount of diacetyl, uh, you're going to have to really kind of consider that when looking into producing a sour with that particular bacteria, like maybe adding Britannomyces uh, yeast. And in looking to produce an acidic beer without bacteria being introduced, um, you could also do acidulated malt. And that's an option um, that occurs when lactic acid bacteria are found on the grain during the malting process. Often used so that um, you can do a little bit of pH adjustments. Uh, you can also just add lactic acid directly to adjust flavor and pH. So acetic acid is vinegar and it's just gross. Like, no, nobody wants this. Um, unless they're doing a sour beer, then you kind of do. Uh, it can be produced by bacteria like acetobacter and gluconobacter through conversion of ethanol, which as we discussed, ethanol, acetaldehyde to acetic acid, um, which can only, so uh, frequently this is also in sour beers and most brewers do their, but most brewers do their best to kind of avoid this flavor. When lactic acid or acetic acid are considered an off flavor, it's usually due to poor cleaning practices or another form of contamination. Uh, regularly reviewing cleaning practices and checking that SOPs are being followed can be really 
helpful to avoid these little bugs. Uh, I've definitely dealt with a couple of people coming to me and asking, I don't know how this uh, particular bacteria ended up in our beer and we had to go through the entire process and every single part of their brewery to find out where. And it turns out it was in their heat exchanger, it was in their hot liquor tank, it went all the way back to, um, all the way back to basically their uh, water. So you really need to be cognizant that once you get bacteria in there, they can be very problematic and they can really stick around if they want to. So next up is hydrogen sulfide and dimethyl sulfide. Uh, so with hydrogen sulfide, the threshold is four parts per billion. Uh, the flavors tend to be rotten eggs. I tried not to find a gross picture of that. And then we have dimethyl sulfide and the threshold for that is 30 to 50 parts per billion. And the flavors are cooked corn and cabbage. So we just want to go over a couple of these real quick. So hydrogen sulfide is produced during fermentation, but the carbon dioxide released helps strips it from the beers. Uh, lager beers tend to have higher level of sulfides due to the lower temperatures and less vigorous fermentation. High levels though are regarded as a flaw and may showcase issues with fermentation or possible contamination. Now with dimethyl sulfide, which a lot of us know as DMS, is when an amino acid like methylmethionine degrades. This precursor is found in malt, but high killing temperatures can degrade it as well as the, heating, as the heat, volatizing the DMS as well. Lighter malts tend to result in higher levels of DMS since it is not heated out, so proper boiling and whirlpool can really help avoid this issue. It can also be found uh, due to dimethyl sulfoxide, or DMSO, which is also found in malt. Uh, yeast can degrade the DMSO to DMS, and low levels of DMS are sometimes desirable since it can accentuate the malt traits and pale styles like a Helles or cream ale, but can come off vegetal at high levels, so you just want to kind of keep in mind, an eye on that. Um, keep in mind there are lots of other sulfur compounds that create far more pro problematic off flavors that are comparable to garbage, otherwise known as mercaptan, and light struck, which is basically the skunking by 3-methyl-2-butene-1-thiol. So I know some heavy chemistry drop, but I know you guys can handle it, or at the very least, I would love to have a conversation with you about it later. Esters, and as somebody, my gateway beer was Hefeweizen, so I love esters. Um, so esters, we have ethyl acetate, threshold is five to 10 parts per million. Um, the flavors tends to be more nail polish remover. Uh, isoamyl acetate, threshold 1.1 parts per million, and its flavors tend to be um, banana or circus peanuts. So yeast produce these esters by joining an alcohol to an organic acid. There are many varieties of these esters which produce a variety of fruity flavors, particularly yeast selection and manipulating fermentation can bring out desired ones, whereas others are more problematic. So ethyl acetate is formed from ethanol and acetic acid and is usually the most common. Higher alcohol beers often have higher presence of this ester since there is both more of both compounds available, but bacteria like Acetobacter and other acid producing bacteria don't help this matter. And it can smell like a solvent, which is why obviously indicating nail polish remover if you're not familiar with it. It's very inexpensive. It's great. It's a great thing to know. Seriously, go to Target, buy a bottle useful for some other applications if you want to get creative um, or do some research on some more adventurous cleaning routines. Um, isoamyl acetate is then formed from isoamyl alcohol and our favorite acetic acid. Um, so it presents in most ales and is a dominant flavor in Weiss beers due to the fermentation with Belgian yeast strains. It's not encountered when Britannomyces is present because it can break it down. It can be used as an indication of the beer maturing for some Lambic producers. So kind of cool. Sorry, it's always gonna loop back to sour beers for me. I love them. Um, phenols. So threshold, 300 parts per billion. Uh, the flavors varies through clove, barnyard, band-aid, smoky, antiseptic. You can get a lot of different flavors from uh, phenols, and that's why it's very important to kind of begin to understand where they're coming from. 
Um, so they arise from a variety of different sources as well. Uh, traditional yeast can give a clove-like flavor, whereas wild yeast like Britannomyces produce barnyard phenolics. Uh, wood smoke and other combustibles can be used to kind of dry certain phenolics. Vanilla flavor, like from beans or barrels, is due to a phenolic aldehyde. So you can have it in a positive way. So don't just immediately go, mm, no, nope, this smells phenolic. Understand the, the phenol that you're actually experiencing. So the presence of chlorine or chloramine can cause the occurrence of antiseptic smelling phenols. Next up, we're going to go to metallic. Um, I know that we had just discussed it a little bit earlier, but you know, it's still something that you should be aware of, especially depending on uh, kind of what's going on with your brewing equipment. So this is usually due to the presence of iron, copper, manganese, um, things like that. And this can result from contamination, but also in the source water if there are issues with pipes or processing. Uh, these ions can also become present when it, equipment starts to corrode. Uh, this is something to be considered when sourcing pre-owned equipment, since some suppliers do not have the best quality products and can develop rust, as well as it might not have been well cared for. Any exposed metals in draft systems can also impart metal flavor, so you really want to be aware of that as well. Now I'm going to not go hugely into trans to non and all, uh, but everyone should know this flavor. Very few people are not able to taste it. It's 50 to 250 parts per trillion. Now, why does that number matter? Everything else we've been talking about is parts per billion. Parts per billion is a very small amount. Most people don't need to care, um, but it's important when it comes to sensory because imagine this is the parts per billion and you need this much of a chemical to be able to taste it. Well, with trans 2 non and all you need this much in comparison to be able to taste it. It is so, we are all so sensitive to it. And it produces the flavors like paper, cardboard, and newspaper. And so it's definitely the best known. Uh, so I just really, so it's, sorry, it's just really, ugh, when people don't understand that this is an off flavor, it's just so frustrating. Um, so this is actually formed during worm protection and it binds to protein complexes. But as the beer ages, the transunanol dissociates from the proteins and that can be tasted. So um, it has become that understood that this particular compound is not the culprit for oxidation as we all thought. And if you have questions about that, I can provide you the scientific article for it, but more as a compound symptomatic of aging and staling because it's the degradation of proteins. Oxidation does produce several problematic compounds that can exacerbate off flavors, but trans 2 is not one of them. Uh, but if you do want to talk about fatty acids, uh, cheesy, soapy, ribey, catty, currant, all of those off flavors, uh, definitely attend one of my um, oxidation talks and I would be glad and I'll be glad to share more details about those compounds. So things that you need to consider when you're actually finally getting all these people together, you've given them all the education on how they're going to do their sensory, things that they should be keeping an eye out for, which can be a bit overwhelming, so you know, ease them in. Uh, but when you're doing, um, when you're going to be looking at this, you really want to consider where you're going to be doing your sensory. Um, you want to consider the environment. Uh, some, you'd be surprised that most breweries don't actually have a dedicated place for doing sensory. They have their tap room, which is a great option, but it's not necessarily quiet. It's not necessarily scent free, especially if someone's brewing. Um, and there's definitely distractions. If people just see you out there drinking beer, they're probably going to not really respect the fact that you're actually working on something. So really consider it. It should be fairly quiet. Um, it should be clean. You shouldn't have any sense. If somebody's hopping an IPA, it's just going to ruin everything. Uh, so maybe put off those tastings for another day. Consider also having a sink, especially if you're doing this at home or wherever you might be, uh, if, especially if you're a home brewer. Make sure that you're near a sink because um, there is going to be a lot of dirty glassware. And avoid distractions um, like other individual individuals, business meetings, kids, uh, especially during those business hours if you have a tap room. Um, 
If there is to be a palate cleanser, stick to something bland like water crackers or white bread. Please don't use popcorn. It's terrible. It's going to cause it, it's going to make it seem like you're trying to taste diacetyl or it's going to inflict that onto what you're actually having and maybe avoid anything with corn because you don't want that to be confused with maybe DMS in any way. Um, so, like I said, possibly enhancing any off flavor. As to panelists, uh, you want to try to have a consistent group of people. I know this can be challenging from a homebrew perspective, but you've got friends and usually if you tell them they're going to be drinking beer, they're probably going to come over and they'll be down to learn a little bit, hopefully. So you want to have a consistent group. Um, and if you can, see if you can find out who has really great sensitivity to certain off flavors. That way, you're getting the first heads up from one of your people that's saying like, hey, I'm getting a little bit of vinegar or hey, I'm really tasting a lot of green apple in this and I don't understand why. You might be able to then kind of explore that more and maybe look better at your process. Um, especially since not everyone can taste the same and this can sometimes be viewed as a liability, but we can turn this into an asset if you actually can help train these people and really give them that education, especially if you have the opportunity to buy an off flavors kit. Uh, it's going to taste terrible, but it's gonna be worth it because everyone's going to learn a little bit more. Um, so with training, um, once the true to brand has been established, how is the panelist going to describe the brand? Description, like we talked about the flavor map and the flavor wheel and the different ways that you can describe color and aroma. Um, so establishing a description already and knowing what lexicon you want to use can help so much because then you're going to have a point. You're going to have a target or true to target. Um, so if the malt is also available, maybe try tasting that alongside to see if you can identify notes or if you have that adjunct there, maybe see if it's really as present as you were hoping for. Um, it may not be as effective though, um, especially considering some of the adjuncts that people are adding. Um, I mean, you, you're welcome to bring a bowl of tricks with you to a tasting training, but maybe not the best choice. Um, but people will enjoy it. Um, just review any changes that the product may have because of supply chain or a change in the brewing process. Uh, when I talk about supply chain, I'm talking about the malt, the hops, the yeast, uh, temperatures, anything that has to be shipped, really want to be aware of. Um, perhaps alter the brand, the brand a little bit through dilution or mixing in with another brand to show that this isn't exactly what we were going for. This is, wouldn't be what we are going for and knowing what that is. And for the sake of knowing the market, maybe try tasting some other things um, and Go to the supermarket, grab something that's a style that maybe you respect or something that you want to emulate so that you can have that kind of comparison. Um, I know that I've definitely gone to breweries and brewers have actually presented me with two different uh, beers and they ask me to give them a flavor analysis of each one. And in one situation, they both had strawberries, except one tasted like they bought the strawberries at Aldi's and one tasted like they got the strawberries at Whole Foods and you could tell it because they had the preservative tang. It's something that it's just, okay, I'm aware of, I'm comparing it between these two. What are the little nuances between these beers? And in that case, it's a fruit, but it could just, you could just as easily do that between any lagers or stouts that are on the market. Now, the other thing that people can, basically anybody can afford to do, um, from home brewer to professional is doing a shelf life sensory. And this is a regular brand check, especially if you are going to be submitting beers, you need to make sure that you know what your process is and dial it in because sometimes you're going to send off a beer and it's going to be sitting around waiting for a while and you need to know how that beer is going to change. And if you know that, then you can kind of anticipate change maybe your process. So um, it's thought that shelf life requires a lot of complicated lab equipment. It really doesn't when you have a well-tuned palate and understand what your true to brand is. Uh, placing the beer in different temperatures and regularly checking can help you better understand how the beer ages over time. And you are going to want to set a schedule and you need to keep to it. 
So with a cold, you're going to have one, maybe six pack or a few bottles. Keep those cold in a temperature controlled environment. Maybe your fridge or a cold room if you have access to one. Um, pull one um, every month and check it against the description of the fresh beer and note how it changes. You can also take some beer and keep it at room temperature. And this way you just kind of know what the ambient is going to be, especially if you don't know if the beer that you're submitting, if it's going to be kept cold or if it's just going to be left in a warehouse or in the situation with pro and professional brewers, you might have that sitting on the distributors. Um, the distributor might just leave that to be um, at the liquor store just on the shelf, not refrigerated. So you kind of want to be able to know what's going to happen with that beer at room temperature. Uh, so also this is tends to be when somebody may be able to find out if they're going to have exploding cans. Uh, the only thing that might actually cost you money in doing a shelf life sensory, aside from maybe wasted beer, is to actually purchase an incubator and then keep those beers warm. So this is basically accelerating that warming process and just amping that up. So you can set it at around 90 degrees and um, it works pretty well actually. And just pull a can every week to actually analyze. Um, because you, you never know what's going to happen, where those cans or bottles are going to be left, or even in some situations, kegs. We've had, um, when we owned a brewery, we actually deli we delivered kegs, and unfortunately the tap account took those kegs and left them under a heating vent for over a month. Of course the beer's not going to taste the same, it's going to taste terrible. But we had no idea how that beer was going to change when it was heated. All we knew was that something was wrong and it took some time for us to kind of hunt out and hunt down why. All right, and then here's the best part, drinks. But drink responsibly and detail all of your uh, findings, write them down. It's really great to swirl, sip, incubate and evaluate. And then you gather all that information and you do some data collection. So uh, remember, it's not the size of your data that matters, it's how you use it. So taking all that information and putting it into a data platform uh, can be really helpful so that you can do a better an analysis. Um, if convenient, you can try using Google Forms, Sheets, or better yet, there's apps like Draft Lab that can be specifically designed for doing an array of different evaluations. Whether you're a homebrewer or a pro, it is absolutely affordable and completely worthwhile. Um, so, I mean, here at Firmly, we believe data is completely useless unless it can be applied. So keeping that in mind will help provide a lot of guidance on how you can move forward with keep establishing your brand, and then being able to consider and continue that from batch to batch and having a wonderful time and sharing that with the people that you really love and care about as well as your customers. So all of that being said, I am all done. So uh, I suppose we could do some questions. Uh, hold on one second. I just want to also say thank you so much to Five Star for this and I want to say that also this entire presentation would not have been possible without several of my great friends that have educated me and supported me and also offered resources like Zymology Labs in Burlington, Vermont, um, Oregon Brew Lab, and my good friend Dev Adams uh, located here in Denver. All right. All right. Thank you so much. So much. Now we, now do, we do. We already, we already have, have a question. question down down the bottom. Bottom. If you want to read them, read, 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 read them to you. All right. So, um, are super tasters good to have on your panel, or are their taste insens taste sensitivities too much? Super tasters are definitely good. Um, it's one of those things where you kind of have to be patient and listen to them as well as figure out how you want to value their opinion. If they're saying that they're tasting um, something that's really kind of random like Mercaptan, then you might want to listen to them, take that a little bit 
more seriously. Uh, but it's kind of a weird place because it's, it's really a judgment call, especially depending on the person too, because sometimes people, if they have a bit of an ego, they're going to want to tell you that they're right and you might not be able to agree with them. And so it's just, it depends on that super taster. I know that I'm a super taster when it comes to diacetyl and acetaldehyde. So I have, I'm extremely good at tasting those, but acetaldehyde can vary so much. And if somebody's just married to a particular uh, definition, then it can be very difficult. So you just have to kind of get to know that person and that taster. Um, I hope I answered that question. And you can always feel free to reach out to me if you want to have more conversations about that. Um, all right, any suggestions for dealing with go, no go tastings for conditioning beers from bright takes? These are often tasted immediately after transfer from a fermenter, uncarved or low level carbonation and not fully conditioned. So not TTB, but are due to be packaged in short order. This has been challenging. You know what, thank you so much for asking that Randy because I do work a lot um, <laughs> Eric, that's the best. Uh, so we do have a friend that does get a lot of, uh, gets a lot of checks specifically for off flavors because she wants to have that go, no, no go. And it's because she knows that she's flavor blind to that particular off flavor. And having that kind of awareness really helps because if you have a variety of people trying it and they're, you're not really trying to do true to brand, but you're just trying to look, is this, does this have diacetyl? Is this going to be an issue? Is a great way to just kind of go, is this the problem? If it's not coming up and let's say you do have a super taster without a super ego, then maybe you can use that and utilize that person to kind of do that in analysis and help support you. Um, and definitely have had a lot of people ask about that. It's just one of those things where it's just, you know, you have to talk with your staff or your community and figure out what works best for you. Uh, but definitely, especially diacetyl, it's a, it's a very easy one to find. Uh, and when in doubt, sometimes you just need to be patient. Are there any other questions? All right. All right. Just wanted Just to remind everyone that, that I uh, uh, now don't follow the email. Emily's information. I would love the presentation if you'd like to go back and for the references. Um, um, the next presentation is from November 18th, American Bottle Commitment. There's, there's, there's no, no other questions. questions. Thank, you Thank you so, so much, much and, and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you so much, everyone. It was a great time, and I'm so glad that we were finally able to make this work. And uh, cheers. Oh, Emily, oh, Emily one more, one more question. <laughs> Ooh, someone got in the last one. You've had some ingredient changes and not always easy to establish TTB before canning. You know, that is really, it, it's a tough one. Um, and if you can't establish before, definitely establish after so that you can learn from it. Sometimes we can't help but push beers out because we have deadlines, we are accountable to our brewing schedule. We can't sit there and wait and sit on the beer. So you can always do it after, especially if you're going to be doing any kind of shelf life sensory. But the point is to at least take the time to understand, especially if those ingredient changes have occurred. Let's say you've changed your malt. We use a particular kind of honey in our honey brown. If we stopped having it, it would completely change, but we won't be able to really, but we would have to push it out so fast because we have to, we have to have that beer on tap. And it's totally valid to do it after and see if it is hitting all of your true to brand metrics. And if not, calibrate it for the next batch. Because sometimes that's all you can do is just accept that something changed and you had no control and just move forward. And if somebody really has an issue with it, maybe acknowledge it depending on how uh, problematic that situation may be, but move forward. Because you know what, people that are coming to you and they're buying those beers, they'll notice that there's a slight change and they might wait till the next batch, but they're not going to leave you because there's a slight ingredient problem. They're going to leave you when they don't feel like they're being heard or that you're not taking your product seriously. I'm 
feel like Randy and I need to have a chat. <laughs> and let's see. Yeah, definitely reach out to me, Randy. I'd be glad to chat with you. Okay. Have a great day and I uh, hope to see you guys out and about hopefully soon in person.